Good morning. All right, welcome to worship on the second Sunday in Lent. Before we enter into our worship service today, let us take a moment to center ourselves in God's love. Amen. So welcome to worship this morning. Welcome whether you are young or old, new or have been around a while, whether you're joining us in person or online today. Welcome wherever you are on your faith journey. We are Community of Hope, a UCC church in partnership with Advent Lutheran, and together we make up Madison Christian Community, where we live faithfully and lovingly with God, neighbors, and creation. Some pre-service announcements today. Uh, we're, it is a communion Sunday, so that means if you're joining us online, now's a great time to grab your elements at home. Uh, for those of us in person today, we're going to do communion a little bit differently. Uh, one of the things to arise from our conversations on, as a part of the transition team is I've been understanding and learning a variety of ways that Community of Hope has practiced communion in the past, which has included not just coming through the center aisle, but doing a variety of sh ways of sharing the bread and the cup. So we're going to give that a try today. Um, so in, during communion, when I invite everyone to come forward, I'm going to invite you to uh, line up in a row facing the front so standing side by side and we'll go through and give the the bread first and then we'll share the bread together and then we'll go through and give the cup and shit and then we'll share the cup together so i'll i can try explaining that again as we get closer if it gets really crunchy we can do it in two sets so we're, we'll see how that goes today. As always, you know, communion's a little bit of organized chaos, and I'm sure today will be no different, but um, Jesus doesn't ask us to be perfect. Uh, life is messy, and the point is being with one another. So uh, we will give that a try today. Okay, so let us move ahead. The peace of Christ is with you all. You are invited to rise as you're able and share the sign of peace with one another. The Call to Worship. In the Garden of Eden, the snake tempted Eve by showing her the tree of knowledge. Eve took an apple and shared it with her companion, Adam. Their eyes were open. Suddenly, they saw the difference between good and evil. This new knowledge came at a price, for they could see the world for how it is. They were expelled from the Garden of Innocence because of their acts. We live outside the Garden of Innocence, too. We also are pained by the knowledge of good and evil. We must cope with this unrest in our hearts. Friends, a part of us dies as we grow up, as we see the world in all its pain. Let us come together trembling as we seek to heal what has been broken and find what has been lost. Let us turn now to our God, the font of all goodness.
<laughs> Sorry about this. This is the one that's, uh, uh, this is one um, oriental. The Affirmation of Faith. This was written by a peasant woman in El Salvador, adapted from Let Justice Roll Down, compiled by Jeffrey Duncan. I believe, God, that everything good in the world comes from you. I believe in your great love for all people. I believe that because you preach love, freedom, and justice, you were humiliated, tortured, and killed. I believe that you continue to suffer in our people, risen in rebellion, that you are present in the far-off wind that carries the weeping of the people, the oppressed who seek their imprisoned freedom. I believe that you accompany us in waiting for the dawning of a new day. I believe you will give us strength so that death does not find us without having done enough and that you will rise in those who have died seeking a different world. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7. 
Now the serpent had more naked intelligence than any other animal of the field that the sovereign God had made. And it said to the woman, Indeed, did God say, You too shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of any tree in the garden we may eat. Though the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, You too shall not eat and shall not touch it, lest you too die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You too will certainly not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree that was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her man who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The story of Adam and Eve is probably one of my all-time favorite passages in the Bible. And it's not because it's action-packed with interesting characters, though it is. It's not because I I think it accurately describes the beginning of worldly history, because I don't really. Instead, the story of Adam and Eve is my favorite because it captures something piercingly true about us. Like any creation story across cultures and religions, the biblical creation story attempts to explain something fundamental about our world and about our lives as people. It attempts to make sense of why things are the way they are. Creation stories can explain a variety of things. Why our natural world looks the way it does, what is the origins of violence, why women give birth and otherwise menstruate every month, etc. Our creation story, in particular, attempts to do multiple things. It does explain why women have pain in childbirth, why life is toil, and why there is violence. But those things are really the side plot of this story. Most importantly, our creation narrative tries to explain our relationship with God. When Eve and Adam are expelled from the garden, this sets the stage for the rest of the Bible and gives context for God's many attempts to reconcile God's relationship with the people. A bond between God and the people is permanently altered, and both God and humanity keep trying over and over to mend this broken bond. You could argue that this is the main plot of the whole Bible. Our Adam and Eve origin story also explains something profound about our experience as human beings. And I happen to love this part in particular. When Eve and Adam eat of the apple from the tree of knowledge, their eyes are opened, and suddenly they know the difference between good and evil. They went from innocent beings who are at one with their surroundings to people who are suddenly set apart by self-awareness. They become fully conscious that they are beings distinct from other things, that they are a self In essence, this is the moment when Eve and Adam become fully human, for they acquire the pain of what it means to have a human existence. 
This is the story of the human condition, of us grappling with why we exist at all and how it is that we know that we exist. It's the pain of realizing that you are a self, that there is distance between you and the next human being, that you are only one piece of the entire whole, and that you will never in your lifetime be fully connected to the eternity of things. Eve and Adam eating of the apple of knowledge is the story of humanity realizing that it is lonely to be a conscious being. Now, it's hard to explain to you how intellectually excited I get by the story of Adam and Eve. And I'm, I'm keeping it really toned down. You can't see it on the outside, but I'm really excited on the inside. Because this story just really nails it. Every time I read this story, I'm like, wow, it really got it. It really captures the ex existential pain that I think humanity has been grappling with ever since our brains developed the capacity to self-reflect. I'm not sure if you feel it, that kind of existential pain we're talking about, but I know I do. And whether we're aware of it or not, I think we all do feel some sort of cosmic loneliness. It's the part of the reason that we strive so hard, sometimes inappropriately, to give and receive love from others. It's often why we go to church. We're looking for that deeper connection with God, a sense of security that we are, in fact, one with the greater cosmos around us. Christians often interpret the story of Adam and Eve as how we acquired original sin, it's the first time that humanity disobeyed God, and from that moment, they acquired the trait of sinfulness. Now, I don't dispute that something fundamentally did change about Eve and Adam, but I don't often think of it in terms of sin. Instead, it's more as though Adam and Eve experienced a death, a cosmic loss of innocence the part of them that was fully at one with their surroundings and with God was gone. They instead acquired a sort of brokenness. The oneness that they had previously had with God was severed. And instead, now Adam and Eve had knowledge, consciousness, a selfhood. This journey that Adam and Eve went on runs parallel to our own lives. When we are born, we are still fully innocent. Our sense of self is fully connected with that of our mother. As infants, we don't know where we end and where our mother begins. But as babies become more aware of themselves, as they realize for their first time they, or they realize for the first time that their mothers are not, in fact, themselves. And this can be a traumatic experience for a lot of infants. Sometimes we don't always understand because it hurts to realize that you are not one with the source of your life. And the journey continues on as we get older. We continue to hone our sense of a distinct self. And as we do this, our psychic pain increases. We have become aware that there is evil in the world. There's warfare, violence, neglect, abuse, and so on. Do you remember that first time as a child when you learned that not, a, not everything is okay? Do you remember how that felt? We begin to wonder as we grow up, if God is so good, then why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We realize that we are but just one small person with limited power to fix the brokenness in the world. We yearn for things to be easy. We crave to be connected to the eternal font of goodness. We long for our souls to be at peace and not be so restless. We grow up, to grow up is to experience the journey of being kicked out of the garden and facing the consequences of being fully alive and fully conscious. It is, this is an existential pain that I'm sure you've experienced in your life as well, and I invite you to reflect for a brief moment whether this is, in fact, an experience you can relate to, how it's felt, and how you've responded to it.
So for a moment, let's just pause there because I just kind of drug you through my own personal intellectual playground. Sorry about that. And you might be wondering why. Why are we, why are we going down this route? So let's zoom out a little bit and contemplate the story of Adam and Eve and why this is a text that we hear in the Lenten season. Why is this? Why do, why do we hear this story in, in the Lenten season? Anyone have a, have a, a quick answer? Yeah, so we look for look we self reflect and we look for ways that we've erred, and I I had in mind a, a particular just a quick phrase why we listen to this passage in Lent, which you kind of captured, original sin. Because in the season of Lent we contemplate the origin of our sins, and this is the origin story. Voila. But. If you heard me preach on Ash Wednesday or last Sunday, you already know that I don't think that sinfulness is the only thing we're meant to contemplate in Lent. And I think that's what you were getting at, Vicki. I, I think Lent is not explicitly and unilaterally about guilt, but includes many other things as well, like pain and loneliness. Lent is a season in which we acknowledge that deep in our souls we feel restless and incomplete, like we are somehow always a little at odds with our existence. We wonder, why do I feel so far from God? Why are we so broken? Why do we hurt each other? Why can't we ever seem to get it right? The story of Adam and Eve attempts an explanation for why we feel this kind of existential pain. It's a narrative that gives us some context that we can hold on to. Why does it hurt to be alive? Because at some point in time, humans ate an apple when they weren't supposed to, and it opened their eyes to the true nature of reality and their place in it. And we've been grappling with that knowledge ever since. The story about Eve and Adam sets the stage for the rest of the Bible. The Bible asks the question, how do we become in harmony with God again? The Bible, of course, has many answers, but the one that Christians hang their hat on is Jesus. And not just Jesus, but specifically Jesus' death. Jesus dies in order to make right the first death that happened, the death of Adam and Eve's innocence. We around here might not be huge fans of the idea of substitutional atonement theology, but the etymology of the word atonement is at one mint. When Jesus died, he made us at one with God again. And that about sums up the journey in Lent. We are in that period prior to Jesus' death, prior to that at, at one mint that we anticipate. So we reside in that existential pain in anticipation of being at one again. And so in Lent, we are all too cognizant of the pain we feel, of that angst. We come to grips with the death that we experienced long ago in our human history when we first became conscious, the first moment we knew the difference between good and evil, which was a death of feeling fully at one with the cosmos. But Lent isn't all wallowing. It also has a forward movement to it. It is a time that we yearn for a kind of peace that always just seems a little out of reach. We want to feel one with God and the cosmos. We want to feel like we belong, like we're home, like we're worthy of our lives. And so we seek out how we might go about getting there. For some of us, that means being present to the pain until that point in our liturgical calendar when we honor Jesus' death and celebrate his resurrection. For others, it is a more active process. Some of us may engage in increased prayer. Some of us may take up a social justice effort. Some of us may meditate. Some of us may go for nature walks. 
Whatever the action is, it is often in service to feeling in better alignment with the world, to deepen the connection, to realize that we are not alone, to realize that we can never fully be severed from that which is so much bigger than us. So when I invite you this Lent to contemplate the existential pain you've experienced in this life, but don't just stop there. Imagine the connection, the at one that your spirit so craves, and find a way to reach out to deepen your spiritual practice. It may look like practicing courage or fasting or intentionally seeking out rich conversations or prayer. It doesn't matter specifically what you do, but that you find Lent to be a genuine opportunity to be present to your humanity with your life, to be present to that of others. For that is one way we find harmony with God again, just being truly present to ourselves and our world. So this Lent, may you find a peace that surpasses all understanding, and may you finally feel home. Amen. Our response of hymn is in the New Century Hymnal number 202, O God, How We Have Wandered. words.
Now we come into a time of prayer. Let us take a moment to lift up our personal prayers to God. Holy One, we lift up to you the pain in our hearts that we feel for those who have been lost. For the three black women, trans women who were murdered this week, God, we commend their souls into your holy dwelling. May this be a reminder that we can do better. That we must hold each other in love as you hold us. That we must love each other as we are, not as we wish each other to be. May we protect the safety of all people. Of transgender people people of color, of women, and for all of those who are vulnerable in this world. And we lift up to you also the life of a Middleton High School student who died by suicide this week, who was a friend of Ben May we be together in our grieving. May we comfort those who loved him. May we learn to truly be there for one another when the existential pain is so great that we can no longer tolerate our lives. God, help us to do better. We pray for all of the suffering that happens around the world. We pray for the people of Ukraine for this time of anniversary since the war with Russia began. God, may we continue to find a way to lift up the Ukrainian people. 
we pray for the people who will be participating in the annual crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, especially this year because Selma faced a major tornado in January, which caused significant damage to neighborhoods and to the town. We pray for the people for whom this ritual of crossing the bridge is a ritual of dignity, of standing up for their town. God, we send also continued prayers for the people of Syria and Turkey who are still grappling with the thousands of losses that they have suffered in the aftermath of the earthquake last month. For the time it'll take to rebuild, for the time that it'll take to mourn. God, we ask that you hold them in your holy comfort. And we pray also for those in our own community, for Lisa J and family who've been recovering from COVID this week, and for all in our community who have tested positive for COVID and are working to get better. We pray for Reggie and George D on the death of their cat, Opal. For Don T, who is currently traveling to the U.S.-Mexico border to work with the Dignity Mission Project. For Lisa Ann T and Raylene F's friend, Maggie, who's taking the first steps through a very difficult time. And for all who are striving for recoveries and wholeness, including Beth I.S. after her wrist surgery last week, and Mark H., Jenna J., Christine H.'s son, and Al W. God, we hold all these prayers in our hearts. And we give them to you in the form of the prayer that Jesus taught us. So let us share that prayer together. Dear one, closer to us than our own hearts, farther from us than the most distant star, you are beyond naming. May your powerful presence become obvious not only in the undeniable glory of the sky, but also in the seemingly base and common processes of the earth. Give us what we need day by day, to keep body and soul together, because clever as you have made us, we still owe our existence to you. We recognize that to be reconciled with you, we must live peaceably and justly with other human beings, putting hate and bitterness behind us. We are torn between our faith in your goodness and our awareness of the evil that has arisen within your creation. Deliver us from the temptation to despair. Yours alone is the universe and all its majesty and beauty. So it is. Amen. Now we come to this table of fellowship. God is always with us, even when we are outside of the garden. God is always beckoning us back into relationship, into full communion with the fullness of life. The bread and the cup are symbols of God's everlasting love, a steadfast love that finds us where we are and offers us life and blessing. We approach the table with humbled hearts, following our beloved teacher, Jesus Christ. Jesus welcomes us and invites us to a place where we all belong. He offers of himself freely that we may follow him with glad hearts. As we partake in communion today, let us celebrate all the ways Christ makes himself known to us and guides us in life. Let us pray. Holy God, our loving creator, 
close to us as our own breath and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world. Gifted by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere through the bread and the cup now before us. Amen. Let us share in a communion hymn together, O Bread of Life, from the New Century Hymnal number 333. This is a hymn that once again reminds us that we are not just uh, of one nation or one uh, uh, interesting uh, part of the universe. Um, this is written by um, uh, Lin Ying Lan Su, and it is uh, essentially very uh, oriental. You'll notice that Howard will play it first and without the um, alto line, just the soprano and the bass, you'll hear it very interesting. They'll be the same notes. And, uh, um, well, you'll, you'll hear it as Howard plays it. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered with his friends and disciples. He took the bread, he broke it, he gave God thanks and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As you eat of this, do this in memory of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He gave God thanks and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the table of at one mint, where we come close to God. And this table is open and free for all. No limitations, no restrictions. God welcomes us just as we are. So come, for all things have been made ready. So again, I invite you, uh, we'll, we'll try this style of lining up side by side. And I'll invite our other server, server to come forward, and we'll come around. If you'd like to receive just a blessing, cross your hands over your chest and we'll offer blessings still. One other piece of information, we're going to put the baskets for the cups on either side of the room, so as you go back and sit back down, you can drop your cup off. So, Joe, you can just put it there. the bread in our hands until everyone has had a chance to get some, and then we'll eat together.
Let us share together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Our God, we are grateful that you have made yourself known to us in the bread and the cup. You gave of yourself so that we may know the mercy of God. Though often our lives are lived in wilderness, outside the safe haven of Eden, you have sent your spirit to guide us and your son to nourish us, even when things seem bleak and we cave to our basest instincts. You never leave us to perish alone. For this we are ever thankful, and we are humbled before you with praise. Amen. All right, I invite our ushers to uh, grab the basket in the back for our offering, and you can bring it forward uh, as we listen to the music for meditation. So for all the ways that God is present to us in, in our difficult times in a messy life, we think about the ways that we offer back to God our thankfulness and our praise. Let us pray. Holy One, we offer you our gifts, our monetary gifts, our gifts of love, and our gifts of service, all that you might know our desire to be close to you. May you receive all the gifts that we have to share. Amen. Are there any announcements for the good of the community? I think that was Evelyn announcing she's hungry. <laughs> or tired, yes. No announcements? Oh, man. Okay. Um, well, I have a few. Uh, daylight savings time starts next week. Anyone else excited like I am? 
The sad part about, oh, Ken says no. The sad part about that is we have to get up an hour earlier. So do not forget to set your clocks forward next Sunday. Everything will, we'll, we'll just make sure to have extra coffee available for everyone since we'll all be a little sleepy eyed, including me. Um, next Sunday, uh, we are going to be doing, actually, I really want you to be up and awake next Sunday for adult ed next week because we're going to do a fun session called Seminary Now and Then. So we are gathering most of our seminarians in this community. We're going to line them up in a row, and we're going to figure out how has seminaries changed or stayed the same over the course of about 50 years. So um, please join us for that. It should be a lot of fun, and um, looking forward to hearing from uh, those in our community who've been to seminary. So uh, let's see. Other news, um, the Lenten activities, I've already mentioned a few times now in worship that we've got Wednesday activities, so there's the Worker Justice uh, Wisconsin study session on Wednesdays. That is actually, um, we're going to skip this week because of Rita Spencer's memorial service, which is going to be here, um, I think it's I think it's something like 10 to 12. It, it should be in our um, newsletter exactly what time it is. Visitation at 10. Yep, so you're welcome to come to that. Um, so we will hold off on the Worker Justice Wisconsin study uh, just for this week. It'll resume next week on March 15th. Uh, but our evening programs are still going to continue. So we're going to have hold an evening prayer in here in the Covenant Room at 6 p.m., followed by a dinner of soup and bread uh, at 6.30, and then followed by our conversations around the book Dear Church and conversations around racial justice within a church context. So you don't have to have attended the first of any of the sessions to come to the next one. So feel free to join us. I do think if you want the book, Dear Church, we are out of copies. So we might have to practice, you know, the kind of sharing that they have in, in the book of Acts. So find a, find a friend who, who might be willing to uh, share the book with you. Last bit of news, um, some of you know that I'm on the board of directors for the Crossing Campus Ministry, and it's a great pleasure to announce to you that the Crossing is having an annual gala uh, this year. It's going to be held at the Crossing, which is 1127 University Avenue, and it is going to be on, um, oh, I wrote down the wrong date. It's going to be April 14th. So, uh, Tickets have just gone live on sale uh, via Eventbrite, and there is a link in the announcements from the newsletter this week if you are interested in tickets. Tickets are $75, and then if you want to cover the cost of a student ticket to help us offset the cost for them to join us, uh, that is $60. And this is a really great event. Um, of course, I have to give it my personal plug, uh, but it's a really great event because The Crossing has been doing some really remarkable work with the students. Uh, being a former Crossing student myself, I can say I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for The Crossing. And uh, they're, they've got a lot of good justice ministries going on, uh, serving LGBTQ students, uh, providing me free meals for students on a weekly basis since there's a lot of food insecurity on campus, um, and then just providing a safe space for students to explore their faith. So uh, I'd love to help The Crossing celebrate those students this year. So please consider joining us uh, for The Crossing Gala. Um, if you have more questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Okay, I think that is it. I didn't bring my bulletin up, so I know it's time for the closing hymn, but I don't know, <laughs> remember which one it is. So uh, I'll let Howard and Lucetta take it away. What? Oh, anniversaries and birthdays. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. No, I didn't almost forget. I did forget. Anniversaries or birthdays? Yeah, Pat. My granddaughter Addison is um, her birthday is today. What? I didn't hear the name. Addison, Addison is... 19? Yes. Wow. Happy birthday, Addison. Roger Williams was yesterday. All right, Roger. He, he's, he's playing hooky for his birthday. <laughs> oh, wow. So he's out in Milwaukee. Well, he has good reason. There, yeah, enjoying a farmer's market this morning. Great. Okay. All right, let us sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, 
Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, let us rise as we're able for our closing hymn, Be Still My Soul. Friends, when Adam and Eve ate the apple, something changed for humanity. We acquired a pain that none of us can truly shake, that all of us know. But with that pain, there is something else, a deep longing, a longing to be one again with God. Our journey in Lent is to find that at one mint in any way that we can. And we find at the end of the journey that God is reaching out back at us. So friends, may you walk the journey of Lent. May you seek the oneness with God and find God waiting for you, reaching out for you back. May your spirits be at peace as you go into your week. Amen. <laughs>